Uh, oh fuck, we gotta do that again because I forgot your fucking oh, name. Oh thanks. I feel valued. Shivery of Shotas. Shivery. For some reason, I wanted to say. Let's just keep this cut and just show no, everyone not. how little no. Alex cares no, about not. his co-host. No, no, just fuck continue. You, no. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a special presentation of Anime Club After Dark. My name is Alex, but you can call me Senpai, and joining me tonight, I have our chivalry of Shota's Shotaro. Alex forgot my name, so we have to do a second cut. <laughs> Why do you gotta do this? I'm so sorry. I forgot. Uh, listen, it, it, nothing, nothing is perfect, okay? But anyway, yes, so tonight, we are going to be doing our fifth Vinland Saga episodic review. So, uh, show. Alex. I gotta ask. Mm -hmm. A lot, a lot of stuff that happened in this uh, particular episode revolved around character building, specifically for Thorfinn. Um, yeah. I was curious as to what you particularly thought about that because I, I don't want to call it necessarily a breather episode, but it's certainly a breather in terms of what we've had the last two episodes. Two. Yes. What what happened in episode? Okay, episode four was action packed, but episode three didn't have action. I wouldn't say it had action, but there was the story was moving along. They were literally weren't they just on a ship the entire time? Yeah, most of it. Okay. Anyways, I really enjoy this episode like a lot. Like, Me too. <laughs> like, um, probably slightly more than episode four, and I really enjoyed episode four. So I really love how it is so um, focused on the trivial things, like the really small things that Thorfinn is doing to survive in the wilderness and just like make a life for himself. It really makes me feel like I'm seeing his entire story, like I'm in his shoes. And that's hard to do. And I'm really glad I'm able to get this feeling from this story it's a lot like episode one and two where they were in their village in iceland and they focused on all the very small details it really is um i don't know i can really i really feel like i'm living vicariously through thorfinn in his village in iceland and now uh trying to survive the forests of where are they england maybe yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm they, really, they in yeah, I'm really sucked into the story, how they uh, are telling it. <clears throat> yeah, I would actually agree. I, th I think this episode in particular, um, and of course, episode four before this too, but this episode in particular really drew me in probably more so than anything else so far, just because it's such a character building episode for Thorfinn. And so I, I, I guess getting right into it, it, it sort of ta it picks up right where episode four left off. Thorfinn's still in the little boat in the back of this little, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, like a little mini convoy of three ships. Um, Let me tell you, any normal child would have died. but Probably. Because he's the main character, he lived. No, because he had the Viking blood, he lived. <laughs> yeah, he's still following Asgard's little troop, which I love the fact that we just keep calling it a troop, uh, <laughs> around. And... Um, I do want to point out specifically, I, I have heard in the first few episodes of this show, um, some people have, I guess the right word would be criticized it for, it's a show about Vikings and Viking life, but it hasn't been overtly violent. Um, probably not as violent as some people thought it would be, being a show about Vikings. I think we finally got a taste of that in this episode, because you kind of got to see how brutal Askeladd's troop was when they pillaged the, the village that they come to in England. Yeah, and that was such an amazing moment. I love how, like, Thorfinn is just, like, drinking water. It's just like, oh, I can finally survive. I can finally take a break from all this pain. And then there's just, like, fire in the distance. And then the expression on his face when he realizes that what shit have I gotten myself into as people are screaming and dying in the distance and their houses are burning. And he's like, oh, fuck. That expression was just... Perfect. I loved it. <laughs> like you, you've heard of PTSD, which is post-traumatic stress disorder. That look on his face was pre-traumatic stress disorder. Current traumatic stress disorder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That the the um 
the the look on it like the way they animated like the the look on his face was really good it's very convincing um and just his reaction to it in general was just you, you can imagine a kid actually responding like that like oh my god i wanted just revenge but what have i got myself into yeah it was a great great coming of age moment <laughs> <laughs> um but then we also got a really good uh, scene right after this where Thorfinn ends up, a- after Askeladd's troop pillages the village and decides to sleep there for the night, um, Thorfinn is seen like sneaking around the village while everyone's asleep or in a drunken stupor. And he comes across Askeladd sleeping in one of the cabins that didn't get burnt down. Um, and he has this great opportunity to kill him because he's able to grab the sword and he, 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 he rears it back like he's going to do it and then he doesn't do it. I think this is the beginning of his fatal flaw as a hero is that he's a little baby. He can't get the hard work done. Are you saying it's a little bit of his father in him? Um, I... I mean, you could say that. That would make sense. But I personally think he's just being naive as a child. just childish. I mean, yeah, that's certainly plausible as well. Um, it is it, it is amazing. He had this prime opportunity to do it, and he didn't do it. Now, the, the, the reveal from this is that Asklad wasn't asleep at all. He was pretending to sleep. And there's a lot of questions that can be raised with that because... He, number one, he was facing away from Thorfinn, so he didn't know exactly what he was doing. He knew he was there. They it's didn't know exactly also what he was his doing. expression of when he was wide awake. Uh, it was so unclear. It was like it was just like I don't know, dead in the eyes. Yeah, it's like it leaves so much to be interpreted. Like, why did he do it? Is he doing it to fuck with Thorfinn? Is he doing it to manipulate Thorfinn? Uh, did he actually expect Thorfinn to kill him? I, I don't know. He obviously wasn't in a position to defend himself. Yeah, but he could have defended himself if he well, wanted. Well, he probably to. could have, yes. But I mean, he wasn't in the like an ideal position to defend himself. Honey, it's a when he, five-year-old I mean, when he realized baby. that Thorfinn was there, he could have he could have turned around and faced and like, go ahead, do it, kid. Oh, I guess he could have. I don't know what he was thinking in that bed of his. It's like it's like the the way this is framed is like it leaves so much open to interpretation to the audience. It's like why is as Askeladd not as bad as we've been led to believe? Is he actually like a uh, for all intents and purposes he's a bounty hunter in this case? Is he like a bounty hunter with a heart of gold? I I don't know. It leaves so much to be determined, and I think that's actually it, it's it's good writing in my estimation because there's so many ways you can go with this plot development with Askeladd's character. Such a mystery. Don't you want to find out? I think there's a lot more to ask Lad than meets the eye, certainly, than what we've seen so far in the first four episodes. He's such a Just mysterious character. Um, I also want to point out, so when ask, at, some messengers come to ask Lad and give him money for killing Thors, and the messengers ask how Thors died, and ask Lad just says, like, he died a normal death. I'm like, I'm thinking back to episode four. I, I just came to myself. I don't think that's how it's normally done, but Girl, okay. Girl, what, what kind of man dies standing up? What the hell? <laughs> I think he lied about that because he's ashamed that he killed such a manly man. <laughs> <laughs> well, he killed, he killed him in somewhat of an uh, ignoble way, I guess you would say. I think it was a shame he felt like he it was a shame to the world that thor has died and asklad is the reason so he i think he's ashamed of himself yeah i mean it it, it makes sense it makes sense uh, i'm again really looking forward to seeing where they go with asklad's character because i think this particular episode as i said opened up a lot for it a lot of uh, potential for development so Something else that happened in this episode is, um, you, as we said in the beginning, you get to see Thorfinn grow a lot because after all this happens with um, Askeladd, you, Thorfinn is basically seen by himself in the forest that's 
around the village. By the way, can I just say the forest that that surrounds this village that does get pillaged shit. is oh uh. w don't break shit, man. It's not it's not worth it. <laughs> My bad. Um, <laughs> yeah, the village that or the uh, forest that surrounds this village that does get pillaged um, is very beautifully drawn. Like it looks really nice. Yeah. Um, so props to the props to the artist for for that because they made that they made it look like just idyllic and just a beautiful place to be. Um, but you actually get to see Thorfinn sort of going Bear Grylls survival mode in this little forest where he's teaching himself to like hunt and uh, survive basically because I, he sort of realized that Asglad's troop isn't going to help him survive. Um, I think the the really cool thing for me in particular was watching him with the um, the wolf that comes up while he's around the fire that he somehow made by himself one night. I'm not mm -hmm. even going to question the fact that a child made a fire. Uh, <laughs> but um, I, when, when I first saw that wolf, I'm thinking to myself, all right, this isn't going to be one of those cliche like, oh, my little forest friend, no. come help me get revenge. <laughs> no, the fucking wolf just attacks him and Thor actually has to use his dagger to defend himself and does kill the wolf. Which I really like um, because it is really quirky for Thor Finn to be using a dagger considering that every uh, no one else uses a dagger. He's like the only one. And we know he uses a dagger because of the OP. When he grows up, he's going to still use a dagger. Um, and, like, everyone else is using swords and maces and spears and shit. And there can be a lot of anime logic to be why he's the quirky one. But I really like this organic way of explaining why he uses a dagger. Is that it fits his, um, like, build as a child. Because he got into the war band as a child. And then he's just stuck with it. So I love the storytelling. Very, very good storytelling. Not in your face at all. It lets you, it's, very it's very natural. Subtle. It's very, it's very, it lets the story build by itself instead of telling me how it's supposed to be. Yeah. Oh, you, you kind of mentioned it, but yeah, you see that a lot in anime where, where especially in shonen, where uh, people will, characters will use a weapon, a quirky weapon, simply for the sake of, you know, wielding a quirky weapon and it's never really explained why they would use such an interesting or weird weapon or Honey. even an unwieldy weapon but in this case it i love okay just like it, i just want to it fits his character <laughs> yeah it's just like rising of a shield hero why is he wielding a shield because he was told to yeah, that's yeah. great <laughs> now, now, i guess the, the thought never occurred to him to pick up anything else i, I haven't watched that but i think i don't think he can actually use anything else I, but like it's, but, it's but like really weak storytelling about, because he was like you can only use a shield just like that's all there's no yeah, like real reason why but anyways I, compared to this where you know they could have been like oh it's my father's dagger so i'll use the dagger all the time which would have been more stupid of a way to storytell it but yeah. He, so often was like, I don't want to use my father's dagger. I'm going to use a sword. But he goes back to his father's dagger because of necessity. And I love how they, not only the fact that they did that, but also how they did it in this particular scene. Because it was really nice in this scene. So, yeah. Yeah. It, it's it, Like you said, it feels very organic. It feels kind of subtle. And it's not beating you over the head with it either. Beautiful. 10 out I know. of 10. <laughs> And then I mean after after this this uh this scene where he defends himself against the wolf with the dagger, you go on to see Thorfinn going all like rocky training montage where he's like, you know, he figures out how to use a dagger, he figures out how to throw it, um and he finally ends up, you know, chasing down and killing a rabbit to eat. Yay. Uh, <laughs> you finally <laughs> did it. <laughs> gold star um, gold star Thorfinn gold star but uh, also one part of his journey to kill a rabbit that I really liked was um, I mean initially he was offered bones from Askeladd's troop and he was like nah I ain't gonna eat bones I ain't that hoe I got higher class than that and then he's like oh I can't hit a, hit a, I can't 
kill a rabbit, so I guess I have to eat the bones. And I'm like, I think that's great character building. All you parents out there, you should throw your children into the wilderness and give them bones and be like, you can eat the bone or you can kill the rabbit. And you'll see how your children will grow. Um, no, but um, I'm about to say, please don't. Just <laughs> do not take this parenting advice very serious. Uh, no, but it's a really great character building in that, like, if he wants. Well, first of all, it shows how serious of a situation he's in, and second of all, it shows that you know you you're not you're not going to be able to keep your pride if you want to go down this route in your life. Yeah. Um, and I really like how, again, these lessons are not beat over the head. They're very organic and natural. And I like mm-hmm. that. So speaking of something that's actually quite natural, um, there's like a, a little cutaway scene where we see uh, back at the village in Iceland where Thor's and Thorfinn were actually from. You see the news getting delivered by Leif Erikson to uh, Thorfinn's sister and his mother that Thor is, was killed. And you, there's this really, like, there's this really interesting sequence of scenes where Ilva, she originally just takes it like, oh, okay, well, I got shit to do. <laughs> She's, like, really stoic and, like, okay, well, shit happens. And she just goes on doing what she keeps doing, goes to her chores, and she she just completely immerses herself in her chores, and, and that's it. And then... They get to the the end of the day at night and she you know is talking to her mother and it's like yeah mom go to sleep i'll uh, i'll join you as soon as this uh weaving that i'm doing is done and her mother is like no you can go to sleep it's okay it's okay and you, you see what she's doing she's she's immersing herself in these chores and these other things to do to keep from having to think about the fact that her father is dead and that's like that's something that it comes very naturally to people when they get really tragic news like that. They try not to think about it, and uh, people go about doing that in many different ways. But there's a lot of people who will just like immerse themselves in work or, or you know school or whatever they happen to be doing when they find out a parent or someone really close to them has died in order to having to deal with the emotion head on. Yes, it is um, very. Um applicable to real life uh loss and also again just like the other scenes we were talking about it's an organic storytelling like she doesn't say i'm sad i miss my my brother and dad i am procrastinating thinking about it no she just she shows us with her actions not her words and it's a yeah i just love that is such a great scene I cried with my homegirl right at the end there, too. (laughs) But um, that overall, just that entire scene back in Iceland was so Mm. amazing. I really loved it. They did a great job. I feel like there's there's probably a lot of people that would watch this that could probably relate to it, having lost, like, a parent or, you know, someone really close to them that might have even done the same thing themselves to avoid having to deal with the fact that someone they love is dead. Probably. Um, and, and again, like like you say, it, it's there, there's so much in this episode that was it was um, there, there's so much of the story in this episode that was told through people's actions and not dialogue, and I think that's it, it's a sign of really great writing when you can do that where you don't have to have people talking to the talking to each other to drive the story forward and you can just show people doing stuff to drive the story forward i i much prefer that over you know long-winded conversations where stuff gets beat over the head <clears throat> like sao over a coffee in a diner yeah um, oh god <laughs> jesus h christ um uh, for some reason ilva reminds me of a winry from full metal alchemist Ex- you know, I was wondering because it's. I feel the exact <laughs> same way. Because she's like a blonde tomboy childhood character, except I care more about Ilva because she's a sister, and like Winry being the love interest feels too cheesy, but Ilva being the sister, I feel more empathy towards that. Like her you sadness. Say, you say love interest, but there's probably someone out there writing fan fiction right now. There's no canonical support for this. <laughs> That's never <laughs> stopped people writing fan fiction before. I don't support. I don't support this. 
So the last thing that really happens in this episode is, you know, Thorfinn, after doing his little rocky training montage in the forest, comes back to Asgard's troop as they're preparing to disembark for a new uh, location. Uh, and he challenges Askeladd to a duel. And all of Askeladd's men are like, well, you can't turn this down, can you? And he, Askeladd reluctantly comes forth and agrees to do the duel with Thorfinn. And he, uh, to Thorfinn's credit, he holds, he holds himself probably better than the first time he tried to challenge Askeladd to a duel. When Girl, he, used a full he was sword. so much better with the dagger. He was like swiping left, swiping right. That was I was very impressed how much of uh he increased his combat skills from mm-hmm. the first duel to the second. I give you props, Thorfinn. You've been working. Yeah. Yeah. Um and so obviously Asglad being a far more experienced warrior does indeed defeat him. Of course he doesn't actually kill him, he kicks him around and <laughs> knocks him down and throws All him. All I on can his think face. of is the kick the baby meme. <laughs> oh Jesus. <laughs> Don't kick the baby. Oh my god. Um, someone, kick the baby. Someone make a Vinland crack with just just that meme. And all the Don't times the Thorfinn kick has the baby. been kicked. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And the episode kind of ends with Asklad challenging Thorfinn to actually achieve greatness on the battlefield and then come back and challenge him to a duel. And then he'll actually feel like he's a worthy opponent. So what I, a great way to end the episode. I, I mean, if you say so. Uh, <laughs> I think this challenge is establishing their relationship. I think their relationship is very, very strange. Uh, and I don't know what to make of it. It's very awkward. Yeah, it's... I don't know if I find it believable or not. I don't know. It, it, that's an interesting question. I I haven't really thought about that too much, to be honest with you. I is it believable for the time frame it's supposed to be in? Probably not. Is it believable to today's sensibilities? Maybe. Maybe. I. What do you mean maybe? I, may I don't know. I. It's, it's very okay. It's very very anime. That's like such an anime thing. Yeah. Which is like the yeah. the the like older bad guys like train and then you can come back and fight me and then the younger shonen protagonist is like yes i will do that um (laughs) you should hire me as a voice actor Um, (laughs) but like for uh for this for this particular real life situation because this is clearly based on real life events i don't know if i believe it but I do like that it's very complicated, so it makes their their relationship kind of refreshing, and I guess they'll have some interesting dynamics. I I look forward to how their relationship progresses because yeah, it too. seems very unstable, and I don't know how you're going to consistently write a relationship like this without going into bullshit, and I don't want you to do that. I know you can do better from this episode alone, so don't do that. Don't be bullshit. <laughs> All right, so one last thing I do want to talk about before we wrap this up. Um, so the OST for this show so far has been pretty good, but in this particular episode, there was a piano piece that played. Uh, I, the first time it really played was when Thorfinn was sneaking through the village and he saw Asklad pretending to sleep. And it's just like this really slow, melodic, piano piece it's really good it set the tone so well and it, it was almost telling the story with the music that's how good it was yeah like the music was basically saying ah fuck what the fuck just happened <laughs> but it was like really sad and depressing it's like you feel like a lost child in the middle of a battlefield mm. with that piano piece and i love i really love that feeling because I'm a masochist, yeah. no, because, you know, I can't even deny it, but I really love that. <laughs> I really love that piano piece. Yeah, it, it helps you get into the story for sure. Um, I I just, I wanted to mention it definitely because it's, number one, it's a beautiful piece of music. And number two, it's it's almost 
it's so good at the point where it's at that it's almost telling the story for you at that point. And that's that's a sign of a really well composed OST when you can do something like that. Yeah. And that was episode five of Vinland Saga. Thank you all there for dropping in to listen to us. We hope you enjoyed it because we sure enjoy bringing this stuff to you. If you want to check out previous episodes of the podcast, you can find us on YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes, and Spotify. If you want to keep up with what we're doing, you can join us on Discord, Facebook, Twitter, and our website. And shoot us an email if you have any questions or if you have any ideas for topics you'd like for us to talk about in the future. Links to all these things will be down below in the description. As always, I have been your host, Alex, and I will see you next time. Say goodnight, show. I'd let Askeladd kick my baby. (laughs) Jesus. You really are a masochist. (laughs) Yeah. And a sadist. Maybe. Maybe.